we want to welcome all of you to our decoding talk that we're going to devote ourselves on talking just about what does the energy code look like for healthcare facilities now that occupancy I1 and I2 have been adopted into Title 24 Part 6 for the very first time. We are recording this session. We record all of our sessions because we take the best of the four, because we do this four times in a row live, and we put it up on our website, www.energycodeace.com. Our last decoding talk was on just what's new for the 2019 code cycle. So if you want to get up to speed on what's changing and you're already familiar with the energy code, you can go to our website and look up the recording. We have one devoted just for residential and one recording just for non-residential, and we always have some fun handouts that go along with our sessions. I also put up three of our previous decoding talks that I think have value for this group that might be very unfamiliar with the energy code since these buildings are new to the energy code. The very first one here I did with Chris Overa from the Energy Commission, and it's all about navigating the energy code, how to use it. It's written very uniquely from the rest of Title 24, and once you understand the format, it becomes so much easier to figure out how to find things. We did one on just high-performance envelopes, walls and attics, and you're going to see the wall requirements that apply to healthcare are pretty beefy, and um, really have to think about how we're going to be doing attachments to insulation and the different layers associated with a high-performance wall. There's also documentation requirements associated with the Energy Code, and there's a new flavor of forms that are coming out from the Energy Commission called Dynamic Forms. And we did a decoding talk on just how to navigate these dynamic forms and some of the tricks associated with these forms because they're so new to the industry. So just a few more things that uh, you might want to look at and review the recording. They're not live sessions. They are recorded sessions. Because that part, the fun part is you get to speed through the boring bits. We are brought to you by Energy Code ACE, which is funded by you, the ratepayers of California. And under the, uh, we are administered by um, all of the private utilities. The decoding talk is a specifically under uh, PG&E. And we are under the auspices of the California Public Utilities Commission. And we are in strong support with the Energy Commission and work very closely with them with all of these sessions that we put live to the public. My name is Gina Rada. I am the host of the Decoding Talk series. I have been doing energy modeling since 1991, and I really can't say it was modeling back in 1991. It was filling out a one-page spreadsheet form, <laughs> and it was very, very simplistic. Modeling started happening in 91. Um, about that time, we were starting, there was this whole new thing called computers. <laughs> I'm so aging myself, Ted, aren't I? And um, it was thought up by the company, um, Gable, Gable Associates, the company I now own, hey, how about using computers to go about modeling these energy calculations? And that's kind of how it all kind of started here in California. Ted Tiffany is my guest speaker, and Versa, there we go. And uh, Ted, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your passion about what we do with the Energy Code. Yeah, so I'm the Director of Sustainability for Gutman and Blavwood Consulting Engineers, and you know we're mechanical, electrical, plumbing, telecom engineers, but our building performance division has been uh, really working on building performance modeling and lead certification and, and really codes and standards development. So. We've um, got staff here that's been doing it for a combined, you know, 50, almost 60 years now. Um, but uh, <clears throat> we do a lot with net zero energy buildings, low carbon buildings, um, and my current efforts are in grid harmonization and decarbonization. So um, it's kind of my focus and passion right now. Which is a definitely a hot topic here in California as we continue to develop code. Our goal for you today is to really understand that we definitely were hearing that there are a lot of people in the healthcare industry who are just really unaware of how to even think about diving into the energy code. So we're going to make you aware of the format and some tricks to read the energy code, then really talk about how does the energy code look different for licensed healthcare facilities and what is it that licensed healthcare facilities have to do under the energy code and also what do they not need to do because they are exempt because health and safety and OSHPOD requirements take precedence. 
We're going to talk about the different ways you can go about modeling healthcare facilities and why you might choose one method versus another, and to kind of come up with a strategy behind how to think about compliance options for a healthcare facility. And then we're going to talk about the forms. The forms are how the Energy Code goes about documenting compliance to the Energy Code as it is designed into the design drawings. And this is relatively unique in terms of how code is shown to be in compliance. Here is our agenda for our session today. You'll notice we don't have a break in here. We are going to use the full two hours. And uh, we kind of break things down into four challenges, and we're going to go through that with you with this next two hours. Now you know a little bit about Ted and I. We would like to know a little bit about you so that we can tailor this session just for you. So if you could please answer our questions. What role do you serve? If you do not see your role on there, can you please type it into the webinar chat? we just really like to know who's here so we can make sure to speak to what might affect your role in designing, building, and um, verifying healthcare facilities. What is your comfort level with the Energy Code? This gives us a feel about how deep we can dive and how much maybe we have to explain a little bit more. And then our last question here is to get basically your opinion about why is it important that occupancy I-2 buildings, these licensed healthcare facility buildings, be included in the Energy Code, which is Title 24, Part 6. Thank you very much, Jeremiah. That we were just realizing yesterday that we should have had that as a defined role on our list. So thank you very much for letting us know your role in the healthcare facilities. So it looks like we have um, more engineers than more than less, and that's pretty much in line with what it was yesterday. We welcome you. We are going to get very kind of deep, especially when it comes to mechanical about how the energy code applies. So welcome. And our architects, we really need you to be up to speed on what's going here to help organize the team to see the best ways to show compliance. And Ted, it looks like we've got a lot of um, people who understand the code, but it's kind of like half and half. So I think we need to stay a little bit uh, floating on top and dive deep just every now and then. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. It looks to see. Looks like we got a couple of uh, owners reps and. Um, uh, building designers, facility systems engineers as well. It's really good. Um, what do you think about what we're hearing about why is it important that healthcare be included in the energy code? You know, for facilities managers especially, you've got to understand what their new facilities are going to have in terms of what energy code compliance looks like and what they're going to be asking for from these design teams that are going to be delivering these new buildings. So it's going to be very important. Like yeah, they, I, I like the one, they're huge energy users. They're a small percentage of maybe our, our percentage of buildings out there, but they are using so much energy, anything we can do, while also always making sure health and safety takes precedence it is good, and it's what we like to do here in California. Thank you so much for letting us uh, know who's here in the room. Let's go back to our presentation and start talking about how the Energy Code affects healthcare. So we're going to talk a little bit about the why. I always like to start with the why because it sets the basis of what is the energy code and why are we even here today talking about this topic. And we're going to start off with our handouts. So in your last email, you were given the option to download the handouts. We find a lot of people just kind of ignore that last email. I get it. We get way too many emails. So if everyone would turn their eye to the left, you'll see Gina's favorite resources. The very first one there is Energy Code A's. Of course, I have to push our website. The next one is how to get to the Energy um, Commission's Online Resource Center. This is the best way to navigate the Energy Commission's website that can be very daunting. So I would love it for all of you who are new to the Energy Code to click that link and then um, save that link as a um, favorite link to have that be the way you get to the Energy Commission's information. We gave you OSHPOD. Most of you probably already know how to get to OSHPOD, but we might have some energy consultants in the room who are thinking about maybe diving into what um, is happening for healthcare and help supporting healthcare. You need to know what's going on with OSHPOD, so please make sure to bookmark that session at that particular um, website. Also, I can speak this morning. And then finally, we have our handouts. 
This will open up a separate browser and automatically download a zip file. And in that zip file are the handouts that we feel that are going to help you best as we navigate this information with you today and after today. So that's the primary resource we're giving you. We don't give you a copy of all the slides. Sorry, everyone. We put together a handout that we think condenses the information well. And one of the ones we added is this watch change for 2019. This has been out for quite a few months from Energy Code Ace. Ted, why is this a valuable document for those who are getting up to speed on the 2019 code? Yeah, this is one of my favorites that the uh, ECA staff put together. This is a line-by-line -line changes in the code. Um, and it goes through each kind of edit to the code, new section added to the code. And what's really important on page 21 is the list of exceptions for healthcare facilities, which is important for this discussion today. It actually goes through each section of the code and highlights where there is an exception for healthcare facilities so that you can then go drill down on what um, you either need to include or not include in some of these cases. I definitely saw, thank you all of you who answered our questions at registration. And one person said, you know, I've, I'm reading over and over and over again what the exceptions are, but what I'm not getting is what I have to do. And I got to tell you, that's what we're really going to emphasize in this decoding talk, is what is it that healthcare facilities have to do when we consider all of these exceptions and work around those and what's still left on the table. We, uh, our handout specific to this decoding talk, we really are talking about what is, when we say occupancy I1, I2, what do we mean? What is that licensed healthcare facility that is subject to the exceptions associated with the energy code? And uh, the kind of an overview of the layout of the energy code, this is based on table 100.0-A of the energy standards. And to me, this is the best resource <laughs> about how to use the energy code within the energy code itself. It doesn't show up till page 90, page 90 or so, which kind of kills me. I think it should be page 1. And we kind of altered it a bit. Anything that's highlighted and completely crossed out means that it is that entire code section will not apply to healthcare facilities that are licensed. If it is highlighted with an asterisk, that means, hey, dive a little bit deeper here. There are going to be sections of this code language that will not apply to licensed healthcare facilities. If it is not highlighted at all, that means that code section in its entirety will apply to healthcare facilities. We also are giving you a link here to reference ACE. We're going to show you in a little bit uh, the, that resource and why we think it's such a valuable way of navigating the code. Now, if you're new to the energy code, you might not be aware of how the energy code talks about mandatory versus prescriptive versus performance. And we're going to dive deep on that. But first, we really kind of need to set the stage of how the energy code measures energy and how it evaluates code requirements. And this is all about TDV energy. Ted, can you talk to us a little bit about what TDV energy is? Uh, Time-dependent valuation is the metric that the California Energy Commission has developed to measure energy use for every hour of the year. And they'll place a penalty um, on each kilowatt hour that's used in, say, the peak ramping period for that you know, infamous duck curve. So they want to be able to um, kind of shape the performance approach to really value kind of off-peak energy. And that's the way they do it through this time-dependent valuation um, metric. So there's a lot that goes into how we measure energy and how that then turns a code requirement into either mandatory or prescriptive. And then we get to play in TDD land when we do performance. And we're going to talk more about that. This page is devoted to the forms. This is how we document compliance for the Energy Code. And we're going to go through all of this so that you're really comfortable with what we're talking about here. But this is, remember, this is going to be a handout for you to use after our session today as a reminder about how the Energy Code applies to our healthcare facilities. When we talk about modeling healthcare facilities, we really have to think about what is available for modeling, what is not. Some building features, such as outdoor lighting, do not get to be modeled for compliance and to give um, alternative solutions. It's done prescriptively, which is a very different way of showing how that 
particular building feature is meeting the energy code. And we'll talk about how modeling looks unique for um, licensed healthcare facilities. And of course, we need to talk about the best ways to be using the Energy Commission's website. Again, I'm emphasizing their online resource center here in our handout. And we'll talk about some other resources available from the Energy Commission that is invaluable for you, especially as a new user. And Ted, how does the energy code fit into the building code? <laughs> you know, this is one of my, my pet peeves is that uh, everybody just says, you know, Title 24, Title 24, we've got to get the Title 24 reports done. Well, Title 24 is really uh, in 11 parts, and uh, usually people are talking about just Part 6, which is the energy code, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, you'll see within the energy code that we're talking about, you'll see exceptions to healthcare. There are exceptions to the energy code, not necessarily, say, the mechanical code or even Part 11, which is Cal Green. Um, so keep in mind, we're talking about Part 6 today, the energy code. And there's a lot that's written in with the energy code for healthcare about, well, you know, for mechanical, go over here to the mechanical or the plumbing code instead. So there's some tentacles that are being sent out to these other sections of Title 24 depending upon that specific building feature. And our energy code's been around since 1978. Ted, get them up to speed on what we've been doing here in the energy code and where we're going for the future. All right, just to be clear, I haven't been working on the energy code since 1978. <laughs> well, we've, uh, we've been advancing towards zero net energy buildings for you know, our 2020 goal for residential. The 2019 code is implementing most of zero net energy for residential. And we're going to be pushing towards, you know, 2030 goals for commercial buildings, um, net zero energy. But this is really going to be start focusing on reducing carbon emissions and encouraging grid harmonization going forward. And uh, it's some we have, uh, it's definitely becoming front and center with some cities that are deciding to think about that a little bit earlier. And we'll talk about those in just a little bit. And this is one of our favorite graphs we like to use at Energy Code ACE. Ted, what is this graph telling us? Oh, I'm a graph nerd. Um, I so am too. I love graphs. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this is a good one, but you've got to really understand that this is looking at energy use per capita. So um, the California Energy Code, you know, implemented in 1978. You see that spike in energy use per capita for California. The Energy Code has really flattened that over time. Um, doesn't say you know we reduced, uh, or kept the energy use in California flat. But the energy use per person has remained pretty stable compared to the rest of the United States. If you look at that same time period from 78 when we implemented the code up to now, the rest of the United States has almost doubled the energy use per capita where California has kept it relatively stable. So that's a great um, visual of how effective the energy code has been. It's what we like to call the Rosenfeld effect because it's based on this one person who thought about what is the best way we can go about saving energy but then not make it, how can we integrate it into buildings. So let's talk a little bit about the Energy Commission's website. So again, online resource center, I'm going to keep saying it and saying it, the hotline. The hotline is there to serve us Monday through Fridays, 8 to noon, 1 to 4.30. Sometimes there's quite a bit of a queue, so it might take a while for you to be on hold to get help. I always tell people to email them the question because then you get a written response. And to me, that's a much better way to get up to speed on maybe some questions I have. Do be aware you can always submit questions through Energy Code ACE, also through the info at energycodeace.com email address. The list server. Ted, what are the list servers and why are we pushing the blueprint list server specifically? The blueprint is really uh, useful because they'll put out um, clarifications on the energy code, kind of those uh, commonly asked questions that they get on the hotline. They'll usually clarify and put in the, the blueprint letter um, a clarification. And we had one like for commissioning for high-rise and uh, hotel motel building that everybody was confused about. But then they wrote a really good clarification in the new newsprint letter. So um, pay attention to that blueprint. It's a really good resource. Also, for those of you who are going to go in and, and try and dive into modeling for healthcare buildings, you'll need to keep up on the latest and greatest certified software. So at the very bottom, you'll see approved compliance software. I know I just with my 
and my team is telling me this purple is hard to read. Honestly, it originally was white. I don't know how it turned into purple. I noticed this yesterday. <laughs> and But I do have to say in your handout, it is white. It's much easier to read in that handout that you have as a download. Reference ACE, I use this at least 20, 30 times a day. This is the code language itself in a um, editable, searchable, bookmarkable tool available through Energy Code ACE. I like to use this online. I keep it as a bookmark because they're constantly improving this tool. But you can download it. I actually have downloaded it, and I use it on my phone. It is always with me. Ted, what are all the amazing things they have within Reference ACE? <laughs> the one that uh, I'm really looking forward to is uh, the connected access with all of the rest of the compliance manual, the reference appendices, and even the alternative calculation method uh, reference that uh, is the guide for uh, modeling tools. Uh, once you're linking all these documents, you've kind of got a instantaneous access to you know well over 2,000 pages of of code and text that's uh, easily searchable. And then, you know, like you said, uh, being able to, to save those searches, those um, often reference chapters was, is nice to kind of uh, earmark, which I used to do back in the day with the paper copies. But uh, sifting through a couple thousand pages is never fun. So this makes it way easier. And I copy and paste straight from this. When someone has a question and they want to know, Gina, what code language are you looking at? I copy and paste. It's just an absolute, my favorite tool that we have at Energy Code Ace. <laughs> now, why are we here today? We're here because with the 2019 code that goes into play for permits that, um, when people apply for permits as of January 1st, this includes when submitting for permit uh, through OSHPOD, occupancy I-1 and I-2 are included in all of the occupancies that are subject to the Energy Code for the first time. The only occupancy group that is still not subject to the energy code is occupancy L. So when we say I1 and I2, I1 basically is just definitions. I2 is where the beefy part is. It's all about those licensed healthcare facilities. I3, which is jails, prisons, et cetera, and I4, adult and child daycare facilities, are still exempt to the energy code and not subject to these requirements. I had a lot of fun just playing around and looking deep into the OSHPOD website. Um, I am, um, some, I'm a junkie in looking for tools and resources to help understand the topic. And I have to tell you, was not quite understanding the whole thing about licensing. And I bet there's a ton of you here in this particular session who can totally explain to me what's going on. I found this flow chart. And just like I love a graphic, I love a flow chart. And this really helped me understand when is something being licensed and when is it subject and through that licensing through OSHPOD. Because we have OSHPOD 1, always licensed. OSHPOD 2, always licensed. OSHPOD 3, our clinics, it depends. And if it's not a licensed facility, it is not eligible for the exceptions associated with licensed healthcare facilities. The exceptions peppered throughout the Energy Code only apply to licensed healthcare facilities. And Ted, talk to them a little bit about when we have mixed occupancy buildings that are going to be licensed. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about how these mixed uh, occupancy buildings were going to be licensed, and, and we talked to the OSHPOD officials, and it's, it's really rare that there isn't a clear delineation between the licensed facility and, uh, and an unlicensed area. Um, so there's a clear definition of uh, kind of the demarcation uh, for the I occupancy buildings. Um, so, you know, OSHPOD's going to um, define that uh, with the plan review, and, uh, you know, that'll delineate what you can take credit for or exempt um, in that facility and, and where those exceptions will apply for health care under the Energy Code. OSHPOD had some amazing tools and resources and had a series of checklists uh, specifically for the architect. There was also one for mechanical because of all of the intricacy associated with designing and making sure to get everything right in terms of health and safety for our licensed healthcare facilities. Well, guess what? Energy Code ACE also has a checklist. 
This checklist is developed specifically for um, plans examiners. So I noticed we did have an OSHPOD plans examiner attending here today. Um, this is going to be a tool we're really going to help you. We have training we're putting together just for our plans examiners at OSHPOD on how to be looking at the energy code. And this is going to be one of the tools that we're really going to be highlighting. We're going to be developing this specifically for healthcare because of the fact that there are a lot of aspects of the energy code that are exempt to these licensed healthcare facilities. And that's all of these areas you're kind of seeing crossed out. This is going to be cleaned up and be more of a dynamic tool to really help what applies to these licensed healthcare facilities and what does not. I think this tool should not only be used by our plans examiners, but also by our design professionals to make sure they're ready to submit for that plan check. Because there's a lot of bits and pieces. Look at all of these bits and pieces all over the place. Envelope, mechanical, plumbing, indoor lighting in the conditioned space versus the unconditioned space. Covered process, outdoor lighting, sign lighting, electrical distribution. There's a lot under the hood for energy code compliance. I think this is an invaluable resource. I see that you guys are already, yet, uh, already used to checklists. This might be another checklist you want to have in your tool belt to help you get up to speed and make sure you're ready for that submittal for review. Ted, walk us through mandatory versus prescriptive versus performance. Yeah, so if you're new to the energy code, like most healthcare facilities are, and healthcare designers that specifically do I occupancies, um, let's start with the basic understanding of mandatory measures. Those mandatory elements in the code, you can never trade off. You always have to do them. There is no getting out of those. And we'll look at some of those mandatory measures for healthcare. Um, but if we carry on, the prescriptive pathway really sets base, baselines for the performance approach and also sets prescriptive compliance pathways for architectural, mechanical performance, lighting power densities, the lighting controls. Um, and those can be traded off through the performance approach if you go through the modeling process of, of adding um, you know, through the performance-based software, you can trade over those uh, prescriptive elements, adding you know, better insulation to the roof to make up some uh, you know, larger glass areas on the buildings. But those mandatory features, you can never trade off. So just keep that in mind. So being aware of this hierarchy and the fact that the code is 100% written to support this hierarchy, and let's start diving into that. This is the four challenges that we are going to walk through with you today, our first challenge being all about how do we go about navigating the energy code. Challenge, our second challenge is going to be about what applies specifically to these licensed healthcare facilities. How does it look different for these buildings? And challenge C is all about what is the best way to determine my compliance pathway? How am I going to document and select how I'm going to show my building is meeting compliance? And then we're going to wrap up with documenting that compliance, because it's all about the form to talk about the energy code. So let's get started with talking about navigating Title 24, Part 6. There is a structure behind the energy code. Every time I go through this with people who have been doing this forever, they're like, what? There's a structure? Oh my gosh, you're right. Because it almost seems like there is no structure because it's so different from the rest of all the other sections of Title 24. So we have our subchapters, and those are broken down into major categories such as mandatory, prescriptive, versus additions and alterations, how the rules change. Then each subchapter has a section number that talks about a specific building feature in those categories, whether it's mandatory, prescriptive, or performance. Then the specific features of that building feature. Exceptions are all about how we look at those code requirements differently. And tables summarize what is going on to help understand the big picture with that particular code language. So here's just a little snippet of subchapter 5, which is devoted to the prescriptive requirements just for envelopes. So that's our major section number. Then the code category here we're seeing is envelope component requirements, component by component. And they're going to first start with exterior roofs and ceilings. And then it's going to go to walls. And then it's going to go to floors. And then it's going to go to windows. It breaks down every single feature of the envelope. But within that roof, 
we're going to break it down even further. We're going to talk about roofing products. And then a little bit further down, they're going to talk about the insulation associated with the roof. So there's a lot of bits and pieces to every single aspect of a building feature. We'll see that the exceptions are towards the end of the written code language. So they write the code language first and then assign exceptions. I personally wish they did it the other way around and gave me the exceptions first so I know when I can just skip reading something. So I really suggest that you really look for the exceptions as a primary target when you get into a new section and then read the code language. And here we have a beautiful table at the very end that helps summarize and give us further information about this topic. So exceptions, reminders, just keep reading. In fact, maybe read these first. So one of my tricks I tell people is to read the exceptions first, then go up and read the code language above. So here's an example of multi-level lighting controls. This is all about dimmability associated with lighting and being able to have lights at different levels of lighting. And I'm going to read all of this, and I'm like, OK, I'm trying to understand enclosed area 100 square feet. But then I get all the way down to exception number three. Healthcare facilities it, in their entirety are exempt from multi-level lighting controls. And there's a lot of heartache you could have totally skipped if you read that exception first and then realized you get to cross this entire section out of your understanding. You never have to worry about it when you're going to apply it to healthcare facilities. So Kevin's asking me to go back to this page right here. Kevin, do you have a question on this particular page? Are you trying to take a picture of it? <laughs> Feel free to see if we can unmute you if you want to ask your question. Um, you're just missing the section. OK, well, I'm hoping that uh, you have it now. And we're going to move forward. And uh, you will have the opportunity to get a copy of all these slides, if you so desire, after this event. So again, go to the bottom of a code section to find the exceptions. Then you might realize you don't have to worry about that particular code language. The energy code is also written in large part by omission, that they very carefully use very specific words when they're trying to explain how code applies to certain building features. Ted, walk them through building commissioning and how we look at this and how this is code by omission. Yeah, this is an important one. And, and one, the Energy Commission had to clarify through that blue merit letter. Um, we're talking about commissioning for healthcare facilities. Look the way this is read. Non-residential buildings other than healthcare facilities. So that means this does not apply to healthcare facilities. And then if you keep reading through this section, you'll notice that it doesn't mention hotel, motel, or high-rise residential anywhere in this section. So the fact that it's not included means it not required. So this is actually one of the things that the, the Energy Commission got a lot of questions on and said, yes, commissioning does not apply to hotel motel rooms or high-rise residential rooms. It still does apply to all the corridors and the non-residential spaces over 10,000 square feet. So if you have a mixed-use building. Uh, it doesn't apply to the corridors, Ted, because that's occupancy R. It's only going to apply to the non-residential occupancy of a mixed occupancy building, of which I have another occupancy associated with the building. The okay. Energy Commission is about to come out with yet another blueprint Q&A next month, clarifying that yet again. <laughs> 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 Sometimes we, the public, need to have it pounded over our head a few times. Exactly what do they mean? Because in uh, this exactly explains this difficulty. When it's code by omission, their potential is what I call, like to call the gray area of code. What did they really mean since they didn't write it down explicitly? Here it's really easy to understand healthcare facilities do not apply, do not have to worry about how commissioning in the energy code applies to them. But it's not so clear with others. And you're going to find that this happens in other areas of code. It's really, there's a lot written like about code by emission when we talk about mechanical also. Just be aware about the whole code by emission aspect of the energy code. Those tables are typically found, they're almost always found at the very, very end of a subchapter. So I tell people, go to the end of a subchapter, see if you find tables, then go back to the beginning 
because then you know in the back of your head, there are some tables here that are probably going to help me understand this information. So I decided to give as an example here how we go about calculating outdoor lighting allowances. All of you are going to have to be aware of this with your healthcare facilities. This is not exempt. So it's all about we look at general hardscape, we illuminate the hardscape allowance by an area wattage. It gets very confusing reading this in code language. But right here it says, hey, just go to table 140.7-A. And here now we see it in table form. Here's our lighting zone, lighting zone 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. We see that we have an area wattage allowance dependent upon whether it's asphalt or a concrete finish. And it really just really helps parse the information and give us another way to be looking at it that might be more useful. We can't talk about Title 24 Part 6 unless we talk about Title 24 Part 1. Title 24 Part 1 is the administrative code of all parts of Title 24. And Article 1 really is specific to things associated with the energy code. So it could be you never read this before in, art in Part 1 because, well, I never had to do the energy code before. And where we talk about here in this particular article is how must the energy code be documented? What are the form requirements to the energy code? How must the energy code be enforced by the authority having jurisdiction? So there's a lot of guidance to, let's say, OSHPOD on what, are, what is the intent of how the energy code should be enforced by that authority. And methodology behind certification requirements of the energy code, such as National Fenestration Rating Council for fenestration and Cool Roof Rating Council for Cool Roof products. So, this is where there's some language in there about how the documentation requirements might look different for a licensed healthcare facility as adopted through OSHPOD. This is where we also find out about REACH codes. Ted, talk a little bit about REACH codes and why this group might need to be aware of them. Yeah, so the REACH codes have been developed and used for a long time. You know, we had those REACH codes for Cal Green back in the day requiring you know, tier one, tier two, and that had some impacts on the energy performance, um, and that was a reach code. And and now today we're talking about some of these electrification reach codes, which are either all electric or electric favored reach codes. You've talked about, about Berkeley and San Jose and jurisdictions like that. So those are coming on top of the energy code. Um, they're not making any any um, changes to the energy code, but they're going above and beyond what the energy code already enforces which can definitely feel like they're changing the energy code. I got to tell you, as someone who has to determine how best shall this building meet these, not only energy code, but reach codes. And we're going to talk a little bit more about NFRC in a bit, um, because there's, that's a really important aspect of how these buildings need to show compliance in terms of certification. But we've got better pictures to show you in a little bit. The, the trap about Article 1 in Title 24, Part 1, is you're not going to find the energy code design requirements. This is just about the rules behind documentation, enforcement, and certification requirements of specific products. So here's just a quick little example of us looking at Section 10.103, where it's talking about the documentation requirements. And here we read, for all buildings other than healthcare facilities, the following documentation is required, a certificate of compliance, a certificate of installation. We have um, been informed and OSHPOD has formally adopted the documentation requirements of the energy code. So you will need to be and start getting comfortable with and start using our certificate of compliance form, which is called the NRCC form, the certificate of installation form, which is called the NRCI form, there aren't that many acceptance testing requirements that have been adopted for licensed healthcare facilities. There's just one lonely certificate of acceptance form called an NRCA form, and we'll talk about that when we start talking about what's been adopted and not in terms of acceptance testing. There is a structure to the standards. Uh, Ted, talk us a little bit about how it's broken out. So the, the subchapters one and two are really going to apply to all occupancies. And those really kind of just set up all the kind of mandatory, uh, some of the uh, administrative stuff, definitions, things like that. Subchapters three and six are going to be the meat of what you're going to look at for 
non-residential, high-rise residential, and hotel motel occupancies. And this section, these subchapters include healthcare. Um, one thing you're never going to look at for healthcare facilities are subchapters seven and nine. Those are strictly related to low-rise residential. And the appendices are often referenced, but uh, rarely looked at. Um, but those are the, the reference documents. Let's talk now about the Energy Code. So we now have moved to Title 24, Part 6. Let's start right at the top, Subchapter 1. Subchapter 1 sets the stage of how the Energy Code applies. It's that scope. The definition and rules of construction is extremely important for all of you who are new to the Energy Code. And I would love all of you who have been around the Energy Code for a long time to reread it also, because the Energy Code defines things typically different than how the rest of the building code defines things. So to really understand the flavor of how the energy code looks at buildings, you need to read through these definitions and rules of construction. And this is where you're going to find that famous table 100.0-A that Gina loves so much that I'm going to be showing you guys a lot. There's also a section devoted to how we go about um, defining and calculating that TDV energy unit time dependent value. So let's take a quick look at the section. Let's look at section 100.0, and this is all about scope. And here it's listing the occupancy groups, and we'll see A, B, E, F, H, oh, there's that I that we've never seen before, M, R, S, and U. We still do not see occupancy L. And then, because remember, I always love to look for exceptions first, we see here occupancy uh, exception three, Buildings in occupancy group I3 and I4 are still exempt. Subchapter 2 is regarding mandatory requirements that apply to all building types and all occupancy types. So this is a, about appliances and how we look and rate appliances. This is also then some mandatory requirements for how we look at fenestration and how we go about defining an R value in an insulation, an insulation. So it's not so much what those design features are, but how we go about determining the efficiency and values of our pieces of the building. And NFRC rated is, a, is something that I find not a lot of people understand, how we go about determining the efficiency of windows. Because we either have to do NFRC rated we can use some default values, or we have this NA6 formula that allows us to take the center of glass stated by the, by the glazing manufacturer. That's so easy to get. Why is this a big deal, Ted? What is NFRC testing and rating, and how does it apply to our healthcare buildings? So you might have seen these NFRC rated labels on the, the manufactured products at Home Depot or Lowe's. You know, those stickers on the windows are for the whole unit performance of that window system, glazing, framing, and all the spacers together. Um, and this wasn't required on what we call site-built glass, which is storefront, curtain wall, point-supported systems. But uh, a couple code cycles back, they started with NFRC rating requirements for the component modeling approach for whole building systems. Um, and it started at the threshold about 10,000 square feet or more. If you had that, you had to do that. And back then it was a mock-up test. Then they dropped the threshold down to 1,000 square feet. And this 2019 code is down to 200 square feet of site-built fenestration. Over that threshold, you have to do NFRC rating. You can't use these um, tables or equations to translate the center of glass values. And these default products, um, the, the default assumptions here are really poor by design. You know, a U factor of 0.79 on a metal frame window, you'll never really be able to ever meet the prescriptive requirements or really offset this in the performance approach with any significant glass. So it's poor by design, and they limit that to being used only for 200 square feet or less of glass. So otherwise, we're going to go through this NFRC testing and come out with this uh, NFRC label for the whole unit performance. You can see here that the framing listing, um, the glazing listing, and the spacer listings are all through this simulation test now arriving at a whole unit performance. So you can see that 0.42 U 
U factor and 0.36 SHGC and 0.462 visible light transmittance, this is the calculated value for now the system, not just the glass. And this is the label that needs to show up on site uh, for verification upon installation. So be aware, this both has to be specified in the design and then delivered on site and inspected. And we like to emphasize this because we find that this is something that the industry doesn't understand, period, let alone healthcare facilities that are brand new to this. And um, this is something that at the end of a project always seems to cause a lot of heartache. So both Ted and I really wanted to make sure that you understand this NFRC process when we talk about fenestration. So really architects out there, this is something that has to be in your purview. What we also find in this subchapter is how appliances have to meet Title 20. Ted, what is Title 20? This is a regulation for appliances and, and other elements. It'll cover anything from you know, dishwashers to um, stoves in some cases for electric appliances. Um, what it doesn't quite cover, you know, things like MRI machines for healthcare, um, but no. mainly those all aren't of those yet regulated. <laughs> Title <laughs> 20. <laughs> um, this is one of my favorite fact sheets that Energy Code Ace has about what is Title 20 and the and the whole process behind it. We have a whole gr a section on our website devoted to supporting Title 20, and this one really talks about what is Title 20 how to go about finding certified products in the database, which is called MAVE's Modernized Appliance Efficiency Database. And because um, contractor, I mean, not contractors, um, our architects, our engineers, you're going to have to make sure that you're including your, in your specifications that that installed equipment is going to be Title 20 certified when it is applicable. So when you're determining what a product should be or equal, you should be aware of, is that product um, you know, certified through Title 20? So this is an excellent handout to get people up to speed on what is Title 20 and how that's going to affect our appliances that are plugged into our buildings. And I got to tell you, part of Title 20 is also LED lamp sources. So general service LED lamps and small diameter directional LED lamps are regulated through Title 20 as needing to be certified meeting specific efficiency requirements and certification requirements, and in the, in the, there's a whole bunch that goes into the quality of that light. Let's move on to subchapter three, which talks about the mandatory requirements specifically just to our non-residential buildings, which does include healthcare, our high-rise residential buildings, and our hotel motel buildings. And there's a little bit about covered process in here. So remember, mandatory is something that it's assumed that you, the designers, are aware of those mandatory minimums. This is how low can you go when you want to start having alternative options when you look at the prescriptive requirements that are layered on top of this. And we decided to really dive a little bit deeper on what are the mandatory insulation requirements for your healthcare facilities. Ted, walk us through what we're seeing here and, and how the Energy Code speaks in U-Factor. Yeah, I mean, this is really going to speak to the architects in the room and the engineers that are perform, you know, constructing uh, wall systems. And these mandatory elements, you cannot go below. But the way the Energy Commission defines these are the whole unit performance. So we don't talk in just the R value of the bad insulation or the rigid board. We're talking about the system. So these U factors, that 0.51 U factor is the base um, efficiency you can for uh, a build for the building. And we'll talk about these metal buildings, uh, metal framed factors. That's equivalent to a six inch uh, metal stud system with an R19 bat in the cavity plus an R2 rigid. So that's the minimum wall performance you can never go below. Now there's 101 ways to build that. You could do a staggered stud system. You could apply that R2 or another thermal board on the interior. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to meet that system U factor, but that's one of those elements that you can never go below. Uh, it's a mandatory element. And 
this is a big challenge I find, especially with um, designers who haven't really had to think about how we're going about getting this U factor and the fact that the minute we have insulation interrupted by framing, especially metal framing, it really makes it a whole new game about what that U factor is in terms of how we're meeting the energy code. Subchapter 4 is devoted to our non-residential buildings, including healthcare, in terms of electrical requirements. So here's an example of how to go about really looking at these exceptions associated with our energy code. I decided to take a, a quick look at what's happening for bug requirements. That's backlight, uplight, and glare. We'll see that the trigger is outdoor luminaires of 6200 initial luminaire lumens or greater have to meet these bug requirements. That's a pretty low threshold. That's a big change in this 2019 code. It used to be 150 watts. But we want to read through the exceptions. And let's say you were looking for, I need to know what's going on with my building facade lighting. We'll see here in exception number two that lighting for building facades is exempt from the bug requirements. So be aware, you know, look at those exceptions, see how these requirements apply to, to your design, and that there's, they can get pretty tight. Um, our non-residential subchapter 5 for our non-residential occupancies, now we start talking about the prescriptive requirements, prescriptive requirements for envelope, HVAC systems, service water heating, indoor lighting, outdoor lighting, sign lighting. Oh my gosh, there's so many here. And we really wanted to dive in and give you some tips on how to find the best table. What do I mean by that, Ted? <laughs> so you've got to find the right table. Uh, there are different tables for high-rise residential buildings and hotel motel uh, as compared to the traditional non-residential buildings. So here's one where we're looking at specifically the non-residential buildings. And look in parentheses here. It says, does not include high-rise residential buildings. So now you know you have the right table. And these are the climate zone definitions. So if you're in the Bay Area, it's climate zone 3. If you're out in Sacramento today, climate zone 12. That table gives you all the U factors that are for those construction types uh, for each different climate zone. And take, let's take a look at what that might look and feel like. So Ted and I decided to give you a kind of a feel of what these U factors represent. We're going to start at the top of the building and look at roofs and ceilings. Our two choices are metal building or wood frames and other. Now, a metal building is kind of like that prefabbed metal building in which it's an entire um, structure that is put together as a metal building. If you have a metal framed roof and metal framed walls, that's not the same thing. But I find most times it's spandex that's used for these types of buildings with uh, at least uh, four inches of concrete. So we decided to use that as an example of span deck with four inches of concrete to get this 0.034 U factor. Well, we need R25. How can I go about getting that R25 to get my overall U factor here, Ted? Yeah, I mean, so depending on the insulation type, this one uses polystyrene at an R5 board. That's a five-inch thickness. If you're going to polyisocyanurate, that could be down to almost a four-inch thickness, depending on the product. There really, again, there's a hundred different ways to make this construction U factor meet the prescriptive requirements. Um, you know, and and again, this is an average over the roof deck. So if you've got slope to drain areas, remember that you can have, you know, say 12 inches on the high slope, and then slope down to that minimum mandatory uh, insulation level near the drains to meet compliance that for that average or overall U factor for the assembly. Area. The energy code is very specific about always stating weighted overall U factor, <laughs> weighted overall U factor, and that is really important when we start talking about different levels of insulation because of design criteria. Here we have wall assemblies. Ted and I decided to concentrate on metal framing because that uh, is most common with these type of buildings because of their fire rating, and we'll see that what's most common with a lot of our climate zones is a .062 U factor. Ted, I mean, that can be really hard to get. How do we get that with metal framing? <laughs> yeah, I remember we were talking about that R2 board for the mandatory requirements. Those are, the, those are the ones you can't trade off. This is a prescriptive requirement. So look at that 2 by 6 metal stud wall. 
in the climate zone comparison for climate zone three in Bay Area, that includes the R19 bat in the cavity plus two inches of cellular polyisocyanurate uh, to meet that prescriptive requirement. Now, is this the only way you need to do it? No, there's a bunch of different ways that you can make an assembly that meets this overall U factor. Uh, we just did a building with metal panel wall systems, and those had a three-inch rigid panel system. Um, that was a m bit more cost-effective than doing a rigid board and all the finishing materials on the exterior. So look at your wall systems in this element. But this is going to be a new one for the architects to grapple with for the I occupancy buildings. Z-clips are a common way to attach continuous insulation outside the framing. Be aware if you're using aluminum or any type of metal Z-clip and it, if it's spaced 24 inches on center or less, that Z-clip must be modeled as metal insulation and metal framing so you don't have uninterrupted insulation anymore. It's interrupted. So you went through that extra layer of insulation for nothing. So really thinking about how you're attaching it. Now, if this was a fiberglass Z-clip or a gelled, isolated Z-clip, that would not be the case. Or you really think about your spacing. Um, that decoding talk we did on high-performance envelopes, um, really honestly, it's a lot of what we talked about is the many different ways you can attach insulation for your exterior walls for it to be called a high-performance wall and the different options to um, go about designing those particular assemblies. So I really suggest checking that out if you want to learn more about the different ways to go about getting a high performance wall with a really low U factor. Even when we're talking about mass walls, prescriptively here we see an example of this 0.170 U factor. The only way you can get it is including insulation. Now that mandatory U factor did not require insulation. But the minute you decide to use a performance calculation and trade away this low hue factor to get a higher U factor because you don't want to use insulation because maybe your fire rating doesn't allow for insulation on that particular surface, well, then you're taking a penalty in your performance calculation. And you'll have to find something that's equal in TDV energy to be able to offset and have that design flexibility you may need for your buildings. Subchapter 6 is devoted to how do the rules change for our non-residential buildings, including house care, when it's an addition, when it's an alteration, or maybe it's just a repair. Repairs do not trigger the energy code, but the definition of repair pretty much is, is you're not changing the energy consumption whatsoever, and it's not considered an alteration. Well, one thing to be aware of that we always read these exceptions first, right? I'm hoping everyone is reading the exception that we have here. Alterations to healthcare facilities are not required to comply with this section. And if they don't have to comply with this section, they don't have to apply with any of the sections. So alterations to existing licensed healthcare facilities do not have to meet any of these requirements that we're going to be talking about. But additions will. Ted, what, how might it might look and feel for an addition? Yeah, so if we're adding to that hospital, increasing overall square footage and volume, um, that needs to show compliance with the new uh, energy code requirements. But any alterations within that uh, existing facility as part of that project don't need to comply. So if you're, you know, adding on to a big healthcare facility and, and working on both the existing portion and the, the new addition at the same time, everything in the addition where you're adding on square footage needs to comply. The, um, the alterations to the existing areas do not need to comply. Let's uh, do a little check your understanding now that we've gone through this pretty thoroughly with you guys. Let's see if you're up to speed on this. i got to tell you, my first couple of questions are so easy. They're going to get harder. The energy code is part of what code of regulations? Title Seven. Title 24 or Title 25? OK, it looks like people are totally getting this. Uh, it is part of Title 24, the building code. Excellent, everyone. Do I have another question? 
Yes, I do. I have a couple of questions. I'm even giving you a copy of Table 100.0-A to help you out, giving you a tool. These are a little harder. Which uh, subchapters 1 and 2 are mandatory for which occupancies? And sub which subchapters will you find the prescriptive requirements for a brand new healthcare facility building? Okay, people are thinking a little bit harder about this one. Excellent. Okay, Ted, it, we have much less people decide to try and answer these this time. <laughs> you guys can do it. I have faith in you. Okay, Ted, subchapters one and two are mandatory for which occupancies? All occupancies. Look, you almost had consensus on that. <laughs> almost all. That now we do. All <laughs> occupancies are always going to have to show compliance to those mandatory requirements of subchapters one and two. Which subchapters are you going to find the prescriptive requirements for a brand new healthcare facility building, Ted? Looks like we didn't have people looking at the chart. It's pretty well labeled there that the prescriptive subchapter 5 is where we want to look for those elements. Subchapter 6 only applies to additions and alterations, which is not a new healthcare facility building. You would only go to subchapter 6 if you want to see how the rules have changed because you're making changes to an existing facility. So it's just really important to really make sure you have that under your belt. Chapter 5, new buildings. Anytime I have a new building, that's where I need to go. Chapter 6 is only when I'm adding on to an existing building because you never have to worry about the alteration requirements for healthcare facilities. Excellent. Let's go back to our presentation and start talking about now that we know the overall structure of the energy code, now we know how to kind of go about and dive into it. How does it apply to healthcare buildings? And we're really going to go through this, and I promise you, we're going to talk about the, our question regarding lighting that Michael has. But let's start at the beginning. That's what we're going to do first. We're going to start at subchapters one and two. We'll notice that there are some sections here, like section 110.3 is asterisk. Remember, that means that there are some sections of this code that do not apply to healthcare facilities. We'll also see that section 110.12 is crossed out entirely. This is never going to apply to healthcare facilities. We see that section 110.10 is crossed out. This is not going to apply to healthcare facilities. So remember, subchapter one is about what occupancies are required what parts of the building are regulated, and that amazing set of definitions that I want all of you to be looking at. Nothing in subchapter one is exempt to healthcare facilities, because this is all about setting the stage and understanding how the energy code applies. But in subchapter two, we do have some exceptions. This is where we're really going to see how Title 20 applies to our appliances, including some of our mechanical pieces of equipment and our lighting um, uh, equipment, such as controls and those LED general service um, light bulbs and uh, small diameter directional light bulbs. This is where we're going to find our default fenestration values that we showed you previously. Ted, can you walk us through what exceptions um, and how, what does that mean to a healthcare facility in our subchapter two? What is it that looks different for healthcare? Yeah, there's a couple of key exceptions here for outlet temperatures on water heaters and controls for hot water distribution systems. Those are specifically exempt for healthcare because there's other areas in Title 24 that regulate those uh, hot water temperatures for safety reasons, including legion, things like Legionella. So it's exempt from the energy code, but remember there's other sections of the uh, building code that will address those things. But uh, Title 24, Part 6 exemption applies here. And that goes there for things for solar ready requirements and even demand response management uh, requirements. So keep an eye out for those. Those are exceptions for Part 6, but it may be addressed in different sections of the uh, building code. So when it comes to solar ready, it just means we don't have to design for that at all for our healthcare facilities. 
they may choose to have part of their roof reserved for a future PV system, but they don't have to because there's so much going on with that roof that's really all about health and safety. And demand management, well, we don't really want things um, being uh, going up and down depending on what's going on with the grid. We need consistent service to these licensed healthcare facilities. Let's talk about what's going on with subchapter 3. We'll see that section 120.1 is just completely crossed out along with 120.4, 120.5, 120.8. There's a lot here that's just not going to apply to healthcare. And we just see things look a little bit differently in section 120.2. So you'll see a lot of that was in HVAC. Almost all of that was in HVAC and our covered processes. So we have to have mandatory requirements written as note blocks. This is a, a definitely a great section to be looking at how to get started with mandatory note blocks and how does that apply to healthcare facilities. I'm also going to tell you about some tools we have at Energy Code Ace. But I'd really like Ted to walk through how does subchapter three look differently for healthcare facilities? Yeah, this is really kind of a key chapter to look at for exceptions, especially around uh, the exceptions for ventilation. Um, in the past, non-residential buildings uh, under the Energy Code Part 6 had ventilation tables that sometimes conflicted with Chapter 4, Mechanical Ventilation Code. For it's healthcare. still happening, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> it's still happening. <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but in this, in this case for healthcare, they completely exempt uh, the ventilation sections for Part 6 and reference the mechanical code for ventilation because the healthcare facilities have very different requirements, say for 100% uh, outside air um, spaces versus recirculating air systems and zone pressurization relationships. All of that is going to be covered under Chapter 4. Um, dead band requirements for um, demand shed controls. Obviously, we don't want the um, demand response or um, temperature setbacks in a healthcare environment, so those are exempt. Um, field testing requirements that are under for uh, Part 6 for normal buildings is, is exempt for healthcare facilities because of Oshawott field testing really covers a lot of that in the other uh, chapters. Things like compressed air requirements or, or elevator requirements also exempt from the Part 6 energy code. And the big one for commissioning at the end uh, there, that last bullet point, commissioning under the energy code requirement that applies to all of the rest of non-residential buildings doesn't apply for healthcare facilities because it is covered by other areas of the building code specific to healthcare facilities. So that's a really important thing to be thinking about, how we read these exceptions. It doesn't exempt you entirely most of the time from these requirements. It's just saying go look to another section of Title 24. So the Energy Code try, is trying to weave itself into what's already in play for healthcare facilities that really needs to take precedence over energy savings. So, you know, that ventilation requirement being one of those examples. Go to that mechanical code. We're not going to be looking at how the energy code actually, in a lot of times, requires higher ventilation rates and how that looks in terms of energy consumption and the controls that we have for ventilation and um, the thermostat. We still need a thermostat, but we just don't need a thermostat that has the dead band and demand shed requirements and integrated with the HVAC shutoff and reset controls, but we still need something that's going to turn that equipment on and off based on the temperatures of the space. So when we look at these exceptions, I like to tell people, look at them in terms of what's still left on the table. How do your design parameters change? Energy Code ACE has a note block um, tool available. The 2019 will be coming out very soon, and I found out yesterday we'll probably be coming out with one that's specific just to healthcare. And this is to help you develop those note blocks I was talking about that's in the purview of the design professional to make sure the mandatory requirements are being integrated into the design documents. So just a little shout out to a tool that might be available in um, uh, throughout uh, our website. Let's now look at electrical. So there is going to be, the, uh, we had some questions on, hey, what's going on in terms of those control requirements that are subject to subchapter four? 
because that's what we see here in Subchapter 4, is what are the lighting control requirements for indoor lighting, outdoor lighting, and sign lighting, including the electrical power distribution requirements. So there's the, the ones to really be thinking about here is for indoor lighting. Manual area control systems are on-off switches. When it doesn't make sense for health and safety for that switch to be in the room, it is perfectly fine to have that switch outside of the room so the lights can be controlled um, by people who are entering the space. And, there's, and it doesn't even say which specific rooms. It just says blank. Anytime any designer feels it's safer and that OSHPOD requires that there be a control switch outside the space, that is 100% supported by the Energy Code. Multi-level control requirements, that's about um, having the lights at different levels. So we had questions about, you know, has to be controlled between 50 and 90% of its lighting level. Just get that out of your, just, just get, remove it from your mind because you don't have to think about that at all for healthcare facilities. And in pair with that is the shutoff control requirements. There was a question about, well, how do I then do the partial off requirements for the office spaces and this and that. You don't have to, because the shutoff control requirements, the occupancy sensor, the vacancy sensi sensors, the, the partial off sensors, the partial on sensors, all of those are 100% not required for healthcare facilities. So Michael, your question about how that interaction with multi-level lighting ability because of what you're doing for shutoff controls, stop, stop challenging yourself with it. You don't have to worry about it, right, Ted? Yeah, but I don't want to say it's not a good thing to have in those office or non-critical spaces. Those occupancy sensors are a huge energy saving requirement, but in terms of the energy code requirements in that licensed facility, these are exempt for that entire facility. So, and, and that's going to be the running theme along uh, throughout this entire thing. Anytime a healthcare facility wants to do it because health and safety is not that major issue for that space or that building feature, it should be on the table as a discussion. But it doesn't have to be if people are nervous about, hey, this can really affect things that are really issues in terms of how we feel the space should function for health and safety. And that includes all of our illuminated signs. Illuminated signs throughout the hospital, whether it's indoors or outdoors, do not need to be controlled with any of the um, reduction or shutoff controls associated with sign lighting or even the photo controls. They can be on all the time. If that's what makes the most sense, it's a choice if they desire to use a, a, some type or uh, some type of control. Just like with mechanical, all the acceptance testing requirements for lighting do not apply to healthcare facilities because OSHPOD field testing requirements already take precedence and already do a pretty good job of making sure any controls that are in place are working properly. Ted, you want to take on the challenge of what goes on with electrical distribution? Yeah, so this is uh, one of those that partial applies. So the, the, the voltage drop uh, requirements are permitted by the electrical code, and circuiting is, is part of that documentation required. But the circuit controls for 120-volt outlets are exempt. So. so there's bits and pieces here. We have to see how it weaves in with the electrical code. But those controls that just don't make sense, as we were kind of joking yesterday, you know, you don't want to, like, have your defibrillator, you know, hooked up into a, an outlet that's going to shut off when no one's in the space. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Health and safety takes precedence. So, uh, Michael, let me know if you have any other questions regarding um, how the controls apply. I hope we got through it in a way that makes you feel a lot more comfortable about what you have to do and what you don't have to do in terms of lighting controls. Just let us know if we can give you more information on that. If there's one thing we have a lot of at Energy Code Ace is help on lighting controls and how the standards apply to lighting, because it's been such a confusing, confusing aspect for most of the industry. That entire section of code can be very daunting to understand. Let's take a look now at those prescriptive requirements that are layered on top of mandatory. And let's build it, uh, break it down by building features. So let's talk about envelope first, which is section 140.3 within subchapter 5. And I've got to tell you that the envelope is going to apply in its entirety. 
There are absolutely no exceptions associated with the envelope requirements when we're talking about licensed healthcare facilities. And Ted, why do we think it's so important for people to get under their belt what these prescriptive requirements are? You know, the prescriptive requirements really form the basis of the performance approach. Those trade-offs that you want to um, trade off in the performance approach really reference back to the prescriptive requirements for each climate zone. So if you're trying to understand where you're getting a penalty or trying to take a benefit from uh, energy savings or a trade off between those wall systems and, and roof systems in the prescriptive requirements, that prescriptive table really defines what you're being compared against in the, in the performance approach. And it really has to be that guiding force for architects and figuring out where are they going to need flexibility with their design. Eric is asking, what, there's no exception to the maximum window percentage. Prescriptively, you're not allowed to exceed 40% window to wall ratio for all um, elevations of the building. And specifically, west facing is not allowed to exceed 40% all on its own. No, no exceptions at all to those prescriptive requirements associated with the building features. So that's really something to consider in terms of how are we designing. And when we're designing the envelope, we really need to be thinking about climate zone. Because that table we showed you earlier had all of our 16 climate zones. And you'll see that those U factors changed all over the place, dependent upon where the building was. What are our climate zones, and how do we use them in the Energy Code, Ted? Yeah, if you look at those prescriptive tables earlier for envelope features, those really change depending on you know where you're designing a facility. Out in climate zone 14, out in the desert, the requirements are very different than, than say, climate zone 16 up in Lake Tahoe. And, and even out to the coast on climate zone 3, those, those envelope requirements are different. But just to clarify, you know, if you're building a hospital on the, you know, say, Santa Cruz, uh, want that west-facing uh, glass towards the ocean, you know, you, and you bump it up against that 40% winter to wall ratio prescriptively, that's where you want to go into the performance approach and see where you can start to trade off that glazing allowance on the west or that total winter to wall ratio. So remember that's a prescriptive limitation that can be traded off in the performance approach. And that's why we really like to emphasize this when it comes to envelope because we find a lot of designers want the trade offs. And what does that look like? Oof, let's talk about Section 140.4, which is all about HVAC prescriptive requirements in Subchapter 5. This is a big old long <laughs> list of exceptions. That sizing, as we talked about earlier, and our mandatory requirements for healthcare facilities, they don't have to meet the energy code requirements for load sizing. There are prescriptive limitations on mechanical equipment for all of our non-residential hotel, motel, and high-rise residential occupancies. But that is not going to be enforced for our licensed healthcare facilities. They do need to use and show that they're meeting the mechanical code load calculation requirements instead. Fan systems, because that's so much it's intertwined with the ventilation. Remember, ventilation requirements of the energy code were exempt. Well, also are the fan energy limitations in terms of how much uh, fan energy you have to CFM are also not going to be required for licensed healthcare facilities. All of the prescriptive zone controls, this is about reheating, recooling, and, and there's reasons why we want to have these spaces meet specific temperatures. Supply air temperature reset, which is linked to that space conditioning zone controls. Um, all our buildings, we have these limitations where we're not allowed to prescriptively exceed 300 tons of air-cooled uh, chillers. Uh, this is, and it's a huge limitation. But Ted, there's reasons why this is just not going to be a limitation for healthcare, right? Yeah, I mean, there's there's certain hospitals that require kind of air-cooled chiller, chillers based on, say, water quality in the area or kind of Legionella controls in cooling tower waters. But, you know, the, this, they, they took that limitation out for healthcare specifically because of those, those things that we run across specific to healthcare. And that's linked to the chilled and hot water temperature reset controls. No duct leakage requirements. Even if all those ducts are up outside the condition space, we don't have to worry about having a HERS rater go out there, make sure the ducts aren't leaking a certain percentage. 
Uh, variable fan speed control, well, that's linked to that whole fan systems, ventilation systems, and pressurization requirements we have for our healthcare facilities. And that also is in par with the exhaust system uh, supply requirements we have. That is a new requirement to the 2019 code for our non-residential buildings, but it will not apply to our healthcare facilities. Ted, talk to them a little bit about these uh, interlocks. So the, the window interlocks make sense for, like, say, a classroom environment. You know, if we've got a classroom that has operable windows, we do want that HVAC system to be triggered off or set back. Um, we don't want that in a healthcare environment. Um, we want to maintain um, indoor air quality at all times. So, Ted, let's tell them what does it look like for our mechanical engineers here that are showing compliance, <laughs> what do they have to show compliance to still? What's still on the table? Yeah, so really this comes down to the minimum mechanical uh, efficiency requirements are still in force. Um, so, you know, EER on a package unit, you still have to meet those prescriptive tables. Uh, efficiencies on chillers still got to meet the minimum efficiency requirements. Um, if still the economizers apply, but there's still a lot of exceptions in that com economizer section. Uh, that may apply to your, your economizer condition, um, things like, you know, if outdoor air quality is, is, is not acceptable, that's a viable exception for any building uh, to get out of the economizers. But that was the one I was thinking might be used, um, you know, a lot for healthcare. Yeah, I can use it for any building, and maybe why they didn't exempt uh, economizers, period, for healthcare, because there's a nice exception in there already? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and the limitation of electric resistance still applies. You know, we're still not going to see, you know, healthcare uh, facilities being built with, you know, VAV reheat with electric strip heating. It's just not a good idea. Uh, so prescriptive uh, limitations still apply on electric resistance. Um, and that really kind of uh, runs down the, the gamut of, of just minimum performance requiring uh, on all package units. Um, built-up systems, things like that. So still going to apply on based on efficiency. So that's the one thing you're going to walk away with. Efficiency still matters. Load sizing still matters because it's under the mechanical code that you need to show those requirements. And we don't like electric resistance. We love heat pump. We just don't like electric resistance. And that is going to apply to these buildings also. Let's talk about what's going to apply for lighting. Um, this is section 140.6 in subchapter 5. And this is all about our wattage allowances, our lighting power densities. How much wattage are we allowed to use to design with? And this is where we potentially can get a lot of flexibility um, in terms of design options. But let's talk about what wattages are not ever going to apply in terms of being regulated here in our healthcare facilities, Ted. Yeah, uh, the specific one for exam lighting, and uh, you know, we were talking about earlier about you know the B occupancies or uh, Oshbod three clinics. You know, those exam lights have always been exempt, and mm -hmm. the surgical lights are still exempt. Uh, they added one for this low ambient night lights in patient rooms, and we exempted those uh, just because they're a low uh, power uh, light, and there's usually a secondary general illumination. So as long as those are separately switched, you don't have to include those in the uh, uh, lighting power density calculations. Those are still a part of the exemptions. And of course, lighting integral to medical equipment, like you know a, a light source for ear, nose, and throat machines, uh, those are still exempt. Um, so. And even though signs um, do not have control requirements, they do have to meet the wattage and or technology requirements of this particular section of code. When we talk about lighting, it's all about how what, this, what is the space being used for that determines our wattage allowances. And I highlighted in yellow here with this you know, category that's honestly brand new to us that's just healthcare facilities. But Ted, these buildings are made up of more of just these space types, aren't they? How do we go about figuring out their wattage allowances? Yeah, I mean, things like corridors that are going to be listed, they're not listed under the healthcare facility, they're, they're listed there, and there's going to be a lighting power density requirement for the corridors or offices within the healthcare facilities. Those are going to be covered by the other tables. Um, but these, these limited um, occupancies for healthcare, 
um, are going to have their own specific lighting power density allowances. So it's really about you know cutting up the design of the building and really figuring out which how is each space being used and then what is the appropriate wattage allowance to be associated with that space. Subchapter 5, Section 140.9 is all about covered process. These are process load environments that are covered by requirements under the Energy Code. But guess what? Not for healthcare facilities. The computer room requirements, kitchen hood requirements, laboratory, factory exhaust, and fume hood requirements, I mean, this is a pretty big deal. All of these covered process requirements that are going to apply to any other occupancy are not going to apply to our licensed health care facilities. So this is a big deal about, you know, we get it. These, these have to be always be functioning a certain way, and we're going to put in exceptions associated with those particular buildings. Let's talk about subchapter 6. That's chapter that is just unique to what is going on for additions, because remember, all of the alteration requirements associated with the Energy Code do not apply to healthcare facilities. I'm hoping all of you have realized I've said that at least five times now, and I'm going to say it two more times before the end of our session. The number one concern we had with people who submitted responses to our registration questions was, how are these requirements going to apply to existing facilities that we're making changes to? They're not going to. So I really want to make sure people walk away with that knowledge. Um, Ted, did we already talk about um, earlier what happens when I'm using existing systems uh, for my addition? Yeah. So, I mean, if, if you're going to be using, say, or tying into an existing central plant for the new, um, for the, like, say, say you have an addition on, a, on an existing hospital and you're putting a new air handler on the addition, but using the chilled water and hot water supply from the existing central plant, you don't have to show new compliance for the existing central plant. Um, and where the energy code applies to that new air handler, if it's a built-up air handler, those would have to apply, but not the existing equipment. Does that make sense? Which is basically just going to be the efficiency of that unit. So when we're tapping into existing equipment, we don't even have to worry about its efficiency because it's there already and not subject to these new <laughs> energy code requirements. Now that we've gotten through challenge B, and I'm hoping we, everyone's feeling a lot more comfortable with this, let's do a few check your understanding questions. Now remember, these are going to be a little harder than last time. <laughs> okay. Which of the following building features must healthcare facilities meet with absolutely no exceptions? And climate zones represent what when we look at those in terms of the energy code? Okay. I don't think my questions are hard at all, Ted. I'm a little, I'm a little, well, I'm glad. We've got people who, we did well on this challenge then, because everyone is feeling very comfortable with what they're answering here. Ted, everyone is saying the envelope has to meet the energy code in its entirety with no exceptions. Is that correct? Yeah, everybody's right on that one. Yay, thank you, everyone. <laughs> and um, pretty much everyone, except for maybe one person, is saying that humidity, elevation, temperature, and weather patterns, all of those are taken into consideration when we determined our climate zones, and that is really what they represent. Is that correct? Yep. Excellent. Let's go back and start talking about how we go about determining our methods to show compliance, our modeling options. Um, because I'm hoping you're hearing now that there are some places that you might want some flexibility, like with your envelope. But I'm also hoping that you're hearing that, well, mechanical might not be one of those tools that I have to have flexibility because so much of it is exempt. Remember, mandatory measures are that baseline. And you can use, um, layered on top of that is the prescriptive requirement. Choose to use the prescriptive approach. It starts to look and feel a lot like mandatory because there's absolutely no flexibility here. It's a more simplistic method. I, f I really have to say these days, Ted, I don't find the prescriptive method simple at all because of all of the layers associated with the prescriptive approach. What do you think? Um, you know, we've been using the prescriptive more and more, and as we get those forms in place that are in the dynamic prescriptive forms, it will be easier. Um, but it, it still is um, challenging for, you know, like buildings that we were talking about that have more than 40% winner-to-wall ratio 
to to really redesign the building to go to 40 percent. Now that is a situation where you want to go to the performance approach, and 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 really take advantage of that flexibility. And that flexibility can consist of just using the performance approach just for the envelope. We just need heat gain and heat loss to do a trade-off. So maybe, yeah, I have more windows, but I'm using an amazing window product. Yeah, I have more windows, but I'm going to do amazing things with my U-factor on my walls. So even just with the envelope design, I might be engaging trade-offs. I might not want to engage other building features such as lighting. You're going to see that mechanical is just not currently something we're going to use in our tool belt when we uh, look at the performance approach because it's just there's so many exceptions. But lighting might be a great uh, design feature that we might want to pair with envelope flexibility so that we can get that beautiful document at the end of the day that tells us our design is in compliance because we documented it through these forms required by the energy code. That prescriptive requirement envelope, it's every single feature, the window, the wall, every single wall, the roof, every component of the envelope has to meet the prescriptive requirements. And it's really great to know that when you're using the performance approach, it's comparing you always to that perfect prescriptive building, taking into consideration your climate zone, that whole thing about temperature, wind, et cetera, humidity, all of that is taken into account when we do our performance calculations. I got to tell you, our performance cal calculations can take hours to run. Why is that, Ted? What's going on under the hood when we do the performance calculation? Yeah, so the, the underlying factor is that you, know, the, you have to use a compliant and approved software for the 2019 standards. And the, the CEC keeps a running list of those. The current one certified is CBETCOM designed by the California Energy Commission, um, and that is running on the Energy Plus simulation engine, and that really takes some time for complex buildings to run. Um, both Energy Pro and IESVE are in um, the certification process, so that's why they're kind of a little bit grayed out. They're not currently certified, um, but CBETCOM is available for use and compliance right now, and that'll really define that standard time-dependent valuation energy use and evaluate your proposed design to see how it matches up in the performance approach. So that simulation tool will be uh, your, your energy budget uh, making application. And a lot of people will engage using an energy consultant to um, navigate this process. I do know a lot of mechanical engineers who look to take on this challenge themselves. I have to say I feel an energy consultant really understanding the intricacies of the energy code and how it applies to the modeling rules is really important. But I get it that uh, you know other people have those skills also. And let's talk about uh, and let's talk about what's going on under the hood, specific to licensed healthcare facilities. What's different about using the performance approach for these buildings, Ted? Yeah, so you'll see when you get into the simulation tool that there are some check boxes for the I occupancy areas. And really what happens in those is it really trades uh, that, that mechanical performance that we used to check for, you know, fan power limitations, you know, the, and, and we have that limitation for, say, an office building or a classroom, and, and they're trying to enforce you know good duct design to bring those static pressures down those elements are exempt so that energy budget that we used to have for fan power um, really gets applied to both the standard and proposed equally so there's no penalty or credit for those elements for HVAC systems so that really places a bigger uh, burden on the trade-offs between envelope and lighting and service hot water heating if you're going that route and then um, the best approach really is to show HVAC compliance on the prescriptive pathway for just those minimum uh, prescriptive uh, performance criteria for the efficiencies. Now there is a lot of talk about what can be done in using those mechanical systems and the performance approach, and we expect things will have some movements there, but probably not until the next code cycle, which is the 2022 code cycle that goes into play January of 2023. So um, you really kind of have to figure out what are 
what, what am I tiptoeing through when I'm looking at trying to use the performance approach when I am doing a licensed healthcare facility? And what is this prescriptive method? And, and Ted, when do people have to use the prescriptive method and performance just isn't even an option? That's mainly for indoor, outdoor, or indoor unconditioned lighting and outdoor lighting. Those always have to go through the prescriptive approach to show compliance. So doing those kind of elements, those always have to go prescriptive. So there's a lot of things that I like to call this a menu. You've gone to a restaurant that has a bunch of small plates, right? And you have to figure out which small plates am I going to um, have for dinner tonight to be my entire meal. Think of this particular graphic we've provided you in your handout as that menu to your small plates and how are you going to go about tiptoeing through the compliance choices. Ted's going to walk us through a couple of projects in which and how they went about determ determining their compliance choices. Ted, get us going on how did you guys go about deciding to go these particular routes? Yeah, so we took a couple of different projects uh, through this modeling process and, and really just seeing how we were going to show compliance for these big complex buildings. And we, we took a couple through the performance approach with just the envelope and lighting and then showed prescriptive compliance for the HVAC, the plumbing, the lighting uh, for the interior on conditioned spaces. And in this particular uh, Revit model, you'll see there's a parking garage, so we had to show prescriptive compliance for the lighting uh, in the parking garage and those things prescriptively. But we're able to trade off the performance for the envelope and lighting. Um, so that's just one strategy here. And you know, the modeling can get really complex on buildings of this scale. Um, and this is where we really want to have a certified energy analyst involved that really understands uh, performance-based modeling for and specifically for healthcare, because this is something we want to get um, really done right. So if you haven't heard about KBEX, uh, uh, California Association of Building Energy Consultants, uh, Certified Energy Analyst List, uh, it's something you want to look out for to really get qualified energy modelers. Um, but for this particular example, um, this is a Highland Hospital in Oakland. This was really designed and built under the, the 2013 um, building code era where hospitals were still exempt, but I had a model for this that we submitted for savings by design, healthcare, and for LEED um, certification. So this one had 250,000 square feet of conditioned space, nine stories, uh, a big block of patient rooms, but lower floors had surgery suites and imaging. This is your typical eye occupancy hospital. Um, but this one is, is not typical um, in the winter-to-wall area ratio. So here we have a 25% winter-to-wall ratio overall. We see a lot of glass on this facade, but on the back of the building we had a lot of, um, you know, back of house spaces, loading docks, things like that, big interstitial spaces, floor-to-floor -floor heights that have, you know, a big impact on the overall winter-to-wall ratio. So when you see kind of... Um, floor to ceiling glazing on some of these new hospitals, it's not always going to be a full 40% or 100% winter to wall ratio building. There's a lot of things like spandrel in there that reduce that overall winter to wall ratio. But in comparing this hospital to uh, the new set of standards, you know, if we look at the comparison, we have some challenges here. One thing to note, the 25% winter to wall ratio in the performance approach gets compared to that same 25% winner-to-wall ratio in the performance approach until... I find people get, are surprised by that. They're like, but Gina, I'm less than 40%. Great. Right. The model's right. the exact same amount of glazing you have. Until you get to that 40% winner-to-wall mm -hmm. ratio. We'll show you that in the next example. So this one had a designed and NFRC-rated uh, window system that had a 0.51 U-factor and a 0.27 and 0.29 SHGC for the different uh, window types that we had on the project. But comparing that to the standards, the 0.41 U-factor is required, and the 0.26 SHGC was required by that climate zone. And we didn't quite meet that with this performance. We got close with the solar heat gain coefficient, but not quite there on the U-factor. So in the models, we started to take a penalty for that window performance. And same is true for that wall performance. We had a really good thermally broken wall system 
which equated to 0 0.106 in the performance approach, but we're really getting compared to a 0 0.082 under 2019. It's a very high performance wall, um, but still getting a slight penalty there. So where we took a little bit of credit was from the installed lighting system. Um, and we got a little bit less on the 0 0.65, and we're able to trade that off. So uh, we're able to gain compliance for this building, even though our architectural features were less than the prescriptive requirements. So I think what's also important to note that you guys were doing so much better on the roof, too. And this is a heating climate zone. This is a Oakland Climate Zone 3. And anything they did to really help the performance of heating energy by having that uh, lower U factor for the roof, I'm sure probably helped you a lot too, Ted. Yeah, and, and you got to remember, if you look at that hospital, um, there's not a lot of roof area relative to the skin load. So what we think would help on that, you've got to really consider you know, that U factor performance of the roof would actually be more impactful on, say, a two-story building rather than mm -hmm. this nine-story building. So those are the things you start to recognize in the performance approach when you get into the modeling details. So um, on this next example we showed, uh, this is kind of a prototype. And this is a 76,000 square foot hospital with two stories over parking garage. It's really going to represent more of your rural hospital or uh, regional hospital rather than these centralized large patient towers. Um, but this one had 47% winner to wall ratio, getting compared against that 40% winner to wall ratio under the standards. Um, so that starts to take a penalty for the amount of glass. But here we've got the prescriptive U factors um, that meet the prescriptive minimums, get compared to the same, the roof and walls we set as are the prescriptive minimum, so there's no penalty or um, credit there for those elements. So how do we show compliance and beat that uh, time-dependent valuation comparison with that high winter to wall ratio? We can increase our U factors on our glass, put more insulation in, or perhaps take credit for that minimum lining power density uh, comparison. Say we put in a 0.6 watts per square foot, something of that nature with a good LED design. That can give us credit towards that larger winner to wall ratio. But I'm hoping what you're hearing here is the design team has to really work together on how are we going to go about doing this. Because the minute we engage lighting, we have to bring that electrical into the team and go, OK, what are we going to do here? And I also find if we're also engaging an interior designer to help with what our lobbies and some of those more um, public areas are going to look like, everyone has to be on board. Because how do we go about determining our wattage allowance to figure out if we can lower it with our design, Ted? Yeah, I mean, you've got an example here of how that lighting power density is really calculated space by space. And you may be able to take some credit for the exam and treatment rooms the allowance of 1.15 here, you may actually get some credit with a good LED, LED design. And the exceptions for the exam lighting here may bring that overall watts per square foot area uh, for that area down. That may be traded off for your lobby or your corridors and things like that. But um, everyone has to work together in figuring out the best ways to do this. We at Energy Code A strongly believe in an integrated design approach of which we need to limit how many buckets that people are working in all by themselves. And that's what makes me a little nervous when we start engaging more the prescriptive approach, because that allows those design professionals to really kind of look at their own systems and only their systems. When we start engaging the performance approach, there has to be a lot more integration in terms of how are we doing trade-offs against different building features. Because the same building that Ted did earlier, he did a trade-off performance-wise with envelope and lighting. But the design team can decide, you know what, you know, we're going to let lighting do whatever they want to do as long as they can show compliance prescriptively with their lighting systems. And we're just going to engage the performance approach for the envelope. I mean, that is totally an option here. Um, another option is to use the prescriptive approach for all buckets. I'm going to go ahead and do prescriptive for the envelope. Also with lighting and water heating, HVAC, that outdoor lighting, the sign lighting, everything's going to be prescriptive. Then we don't have the need to use anyone who, has to, who knows the software and so forth. But I find a lot of people don't really truly understand the prescriptive requirements and how particularly um, 
rigid they can be in terms of their design options. So really think carefully about how are we going to go about in, engaging the design team versus dependent upon which method you're going to use to show compliance. Let's do a check your understanding and see how you guys feel about your modeling choices and design options. So my first question here is going to be, which compliance method is going to provide you the most compliance flexibility? Second question, which compliance method has to be used, I don't care, for all projects that trigger the energy code? Okay, so which compliance method is going to provide you the most compliance flexibility? Well, that's going to be the performance approach. The method that might provide you the most um, flexibility in terms of no one has to talk to each other, <laughs> that would be the prescriptive approach. But we want compliance flexibility, design choices. Ted, which compliance method has to be used for all projects that trigger the code? I don't care always the mandatory elements, always a must. Never can talk anybody out of it. <laughs> Excellent, everyone. Let's go back to our presentation and start talking about the forms that are going to be required for showing documentation to your compliance choices, whether you decided to go performance, prescriptive, and what does that look like building feature by building feature. And that's why we developed this page in your handout You'll see here that for the performance approach, that's only available for envelope mechanical. And you guys now know for HVAC, it's really not the greatest method. Even though you can go ahead and put it all into that performance calculation, you're not getting anything out of it. So you really might want to look at the prescriptive approach in which the form associated with prescriptive compliance is that NRCC document dash MCH for mechanical dash E. Ted, what is the Certificate of Compliance? Why is it so important to this entire energy code process? Because it really documents how we're going to show compliance and those, defines those building elements for the contractors to pick up and really say, OK, this is the U factor we need to build for the building. This is what I'm contracted to deliver. And, and documents all the elements that need to show compliance from wall systems to window systems that NFRC rating, those kind of things are documented on the Certificate of Compliance. You'll notice that under mandatory, you'll see a lot of note block, note block, because there isn't a form associated with showing compliance to the mandatory requirements, let's say, for envelope. But you'll see that there is the form NRCC PRC for refrigerated warehouse. And Ted and I had to scratch our heads a little bit and go, hmm, when would a refrigerated warehouse that exceeds 3,000 square feet apply to a hospital? Ted, when might that be something they have to think about? Sorry, state that one more time. <laughs> <laughs> OK, you were multitasking, weren't you? When would a refrigerated warehouse over 3,000 square feet ever apply to a hospital? Yeah, this is the one we keep arguing about. And, and we were having the discussion about what would be considered a refrigerated warehouse. And, and the only thing I can think of ever that might qualify for that would be a, a, a large morgue in a hospital. Um, but I can, I can almost guarantee that that would never be considered a refrigerated warehouse in this instance as a standalone building. So I'm, I'm hoping that doesn't ever get applied. <laughs> <laughs> so some of these things didn't get blatantly written in exception to licensed healthcare facilities. It's the fact because, well, it's just never going to apply. Like commercial retail refrigeration is for grocery stores exceeding 8,000 square feet. That's never going to be a licensed healthcare facility. So yes, we have those forms listed here. But honestly, the chances they will ever really ever apply to a healthcare facility is probably never going to happen. So don't worry that you're going to have to worry about all of this documentation. Because remember, OSHPOD has formally declared that they are adopting the energy code documentation that they already have in place in terms of the Certificate of Compliance form, that NRCC form, the Certificate of Installation form, the NRCI form. Ted, when do we use the Certificate of Installation form, and who uses it, and why? 
yeah, I never have to use it because I'm not an installing contractor. <laughs> this document is really for the contractors to document what they got, what they installed on site, and they certify that it meets the requirements of compliance. So that's that's an installing contractor form. And I find that we definitely need to have meetings with all the contractors at the very beginning going, this is a new form you've probably never dealt with before because they've only ever just done health care. And what does this look like? And how do we get every installing contractor to provide this documentation? And this documentation then um, lives with the owner of that hospital. This is a, a liability document between the contractor saying, I understood what was required by the energy code by understanding the certificate of compliance document, and this is what I installed. And I usually tell people, attach this form to the approved submittals. That is exactly what was installed, but then you got that design professional in, involved because they had to formally approve that feature as meeting the design, including those design features of the energy code. The certificate of acceptance forms are all about installed features being tested as meeting the requirements of how they should be installed. You'll see that most of these are grayed out and struck out because they just are not going to apply to healthcare facilities because remember we talked about how acceptance testing for mechanical and for lighting systems does not apply to licensed healthcare facilities. OSHPOD field inspection criteria and um, process takes precedence. But there's one lonely form there that's in beautiful purple there, Ted. What is that loan acceptance form all about, and why is that one being adopted by OSHPOD? <laughs> that's, that's a critical one for the NFRC label requirements for those window wall systems. So that's something we want to have uh, uh, documented on that certificate of acceptance. So hopefully you're feeling a little bit more comfortable about the forms. We also are letting you know where to find the forms. That's included on your handout. And let's just talk review again. What are you going to see most and what are you going to see never? So the ones that have the green stars on them, these are the ones that you're probably going to see the most. Um, sign lighting has to use the prescriptive approach. So you're going to have to use the NRCC LTS form. Outdoor lighting has to show compliance with the prescriptive method, so you're going to see the NRCC LTO form. Electrical distribution, remember this is all about uh, showing compliance to the voltage drop requirements of the energy code when it is allowed by the electrical code. There's a lot of intermingling going on there. Well, you're going to use this form to show compliance for voltage drop. You're never, ever going to see the NRCC CRA form because that's about solar ready. And remember, licensed healthcare facilities do not have to show compliance to the solar ready requirements of the energy code, and they're not going to use the commissioning forms of the energy code because they're going to use what's applicable for Chapter 7. You're going to probably see this NRCC PERF form, that is the performance form, because we really think that is the best method to show compliance for your envelope, and you might be throwing your indoor conditioned lighting in there also. But we feel that the NRCC MEC form, the prescriptive form for mechanical, and the NRCC PLB form, the prescriptive form for plumbing, is what's going to be the most common method and probably the only method really available to you that makes sense for this next code cycle for those systems. The LTI form, well, it depends. If you decided to use your indoor conditioned lighting in the performance approach, you're not going to see this prescriptive form. You never double dip. You don't document the same building feature more than once. If we already documented the envelope and the indoor lighting system and the performance calculation, we don't do it again with these prescriptive forms. So this is all part of trying to make sure to keep track of what forms do we need because what method we, did we decide to do. We're not really sure you're going to see the covered process form that much unless you have like a humongous morgue. <laughs> that exceeds 3,000 square feet. Um, uh, getting a question here, can we benefit, how can we benefit if we have solar for an I2 uh, hospital? Um, you benefit by the fact that they save energy. They're, they're their own energy source, but you get no credit for that in terms of the energy code. Currently, there are absolutely no credits associated with photovoltaic systems in a performance calculation. I don't care what building type you are. I don't care if it's a 
hotel, motel building. I don't care if it's an office building. We are at the Energy Code currently really trying to make building efficiency and, and how we're building our buildings be more of what we are codifying before we get to energy generation for our non-residential buildings. So that's just not something that's part of the discussion currently. It might be part of the discussion for LEED. It might be part of the discussion for savings by design. Uh, Ted, does savings by design give credit for PV? Uh, not currently, and savings by design healthcare is uh, currently on hold, uh, reformulating the entire savings by design. Um, so maybe we'll see program. it for savings by design, but it's not something we're going to see for code compliance to the energy code. But it might be a really good idea. We don't want to discount really good ideas here. The NRCI forms, the NRCA forms, those are all going to be available at the Energy Commission's website. We gave you the links from here. Those links are also in your handout. And I also want to shout out that Energy Code ACE is going to be putting a fact sheet together on healthcare, where a lot of this is going to be supported with that fact sheet also. Um, we tried really hard that the handout we're giving you guys now is not superseding what's going to be in that fact sheet. So there's reasons to keep up on what's coming from Energy Code ACE. We're going to push the blueprint again. Um, this is, I, it only comes out four times a year. You sign up for this listserv, and you only get four emails a year, and it is an excellent way to get up to speed. In fact, they have all of them archived on their website. And in fact, Energy Code ACE has a tool called uh, Q&A that includes all of the questions and answers that have been integrated into all of the past blueprints including all the questions and answers and um, uh, examples integrated within the manuals that Ted and I were talking about way in the beginning, how great the manuals are to support the code. So I know I totally pushed Reference ACE as my favorite tool, but there are some other great tools available through Energy Code ACE. And for those of you who are feeling totally overwhelmed about the forms, please come to our website and check out what's called Jetpack. Jetpack is being kind of like labeled as the turbo tax of all of these forms. And if you're feeling overwhelmed with how to figure out how to navigate these forms and the prescriptive method, please check out um, Jetpack. I do want to highlight our resources. Again, we're going to have new fact sheets out. There's going to be a new fact sheet out just for healthcare coming out very, very soon. Trigger sheets are never going to apply to you because those only apply to alteration projects. And remember, I'm now saying it for a sixth time. <laughs> Alterations to existing healthcare facilities never have to meet the energy code requirements, though additions and brand new licensed healthcare facilities will. We talked about these checklists that help us walk through uh, the, the, what we need to have in place to be ready for compliance. We have some application guides. These are picture books to how code applies. We currently don't have one for healthcare, but I really think the one for envelope and for lighting is going to be a valuable tool, remembering that uh, there's going to be some exceptions written into the lighting one, that those are going to be included, but lighting in its entirety is going to apply to these buildings. We are now in the last minute of our session with you guys. We are going to be asking you to take a survey. We're going to ask you at least three times to take the survey. You only need to take it once. Ted, how many times do they need to take the survey? Just once, Gina. OK, that always ends up being a question at the very end. <laughs> and um, the survey allows you to request a copy of my slides. I always get the question, can I have a copy of your slide deck? Yes, but only after you take my survey, because of how important the survey is to make sure we're getting things done right. What else would you like to hear from us? And also, it's a great way to maybe get signed up for Energy Code Ace. We are going to be coming out with a series of classes to help support you, the designers. Um, they're going to be virtual online classes. We do a lot of that in Energy Code Ace. Come check out our virtual online classes. We're going to be coming out with plans examiner um, training for the OSHPOD plan checkers using that checklist. We really want to help you guys. And Ted and I are here to help you. So if you have any questions after today about how code applies to healthcare, you have our contact information. We have been authorized to make sure we're here to help you. And please also let us know what else we can do, what other tools and resources can we provide 
to help you get this under your belt. Do we have any questions from people in the group? I think we've answered all of the questions. Ted, do you think we have? Yeah, I think we, we went through the ones that were on the chat list, but if there's anything additional that you guys want to voice, uh, you know, feel free to either take yourself off and mute or raise your hand and we can unmute you. Happy to address questions and we can hang out for a few more minutes if you want to. Feel free to type your questions into the chat. If you would like to talk out loud, please raise your hand and then we'll help you with how best to get yourself unmuted to be able to speak out loud. We love hearing real voices, by the way. Ted and I love each other, but sometimes it's lonely, just the two of us. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we uh, remember, we're going to be sending you certificates of participation. I did have a question with someone asking how they get AIA credit for today. This has not um, been registered through AIA as a specific event. That's just we don't do these for decoding talk. But you can take your certificate. We're going to send you in a couple of weeks. Give us a couple of weeks, please. And you can use that to self-certify. If you attended as a group, meaning one person registered, but a group of people were all crowded around one computer, please send us the names and emails of everyone that attended, and we'll make sure each person gets their very own certificate of participation. Do we have any questions? Otherwise, we're going to let you guys go for the day. Have a great rest of your Thursday. Ted, thanks for being my guest speaker. Always. And I'll see you soon. <laughs> And Jill always put it out here. I usually say this, but she's with us today. Jill Marver at pg e is the manager of the Decoding Talk series, and she's also in charge of making sure Energy Code Ace is doing what we should be doing for the state. Feel free to reach out to her directly with any uh, questions, comments, or concerns, or what you'd like to see in this upcoming code cycle. She's the one who's going to get it done. If you emailed me, all I'd do is I would send it to her. So you have her direct contact in terms of what you would like to see. Any questions? I don't see any hands have been raised. I'm not seeing any new typing here happening. We're just going to sit here and mellow out for a minute. If there is no activity, we're going to boot you all out of here and say have a great rest of your Thursday. <laughs>